Good day. I want to thank the organizers for organizing this conference. Don't you think it's great? This is wonderful. Every year we have conferences like this in Ukraine. Not only that, but I'd like to thank all of you for coming today, for showing the interest, for wanting to hear new ideas, to be open to those new ideas. It's a very important thing to be open. Just had a conversation with my husband about that. Be more open. <laughs> None of us is alone in this world. The bridges that we already have and the ones that we build every day, they help us to be part of society, to be part of a group, to be part of a family, even to be part of an audience. When we think of bridges, we think of this. We think of Bridge Potona here in Kyiv. It links two sides of a city. It links the right bank and the left bank of KU. Thousands of people travel over this bridge every day so that they can get from one side to the other. What you might not know about this bridge is it was built in 1953, and it was the first all-welded bridge in the whole world. Welding, that's another bridge. It connects two pieces of metal together to hold them very tightly so that they can't break. Before welding, a bridge like this would have fallen apart. Important to know. Another bridge. This is from Manhattan, the Brooklyn Bridge. It connects Brooklyn and New York City. Before that, before it was built in 1863, there were only ferries that took people back and forth. It was a very long trip. There wasn't a lot of connections. Once the, build, the bridge was built, people started driving over it. People started walking over it. And now it connects two parts of the city and makes it whole. They continue to have a walkway, though, so that you can allow people to walk slowly across the bridge to make not only the physical connection between the two islands, but also the connection between the people, the conversations, the talking. Those are all really important connections as well. Some bridges are broken. This is a picture from bridges in eastern Ukraine where there's a war. Bridges are being destroyed by the Russian forces. To destroy the bridges, the connections, the physical connections between that part of Ukraine and the rest of Ukraine. You can see here in Dnipropetrovsk more bridges being destroyed. And it's not only bridges, physical bridges, that are being destroyed between people, but it's all the connections. It's communication, it's families, it's breaking apart society, those bridges that existed between that part of Ukraine and the rest of Ukraine are being broken. However, we're working hard at building those bridges again, both physically by bringing in army engineers and connecting those two parts of Ukraine together again through having roads and bridges. Over 55 bridges were destroyed in 2014 alone. 2014 alone. And those bridges are now being rebuilt by army engineers to bring the two parts of Ukraine back together again. And it's not only the building of bridges that happen, it's also the building of those connections. Today, we're going to hear from people who work as humanitarian aid or medical workers in those zones. It's those people that are bringing the connections back, the interpersonal bridges back, the communication back between the temporarily occupied territories and the and the rest of Ukraine. The bridges being built, some of them are pontoons. Those are temporary bridges to make things move forward quickly. You can see that they actually float on the water, but they allow the connection, the bridging between the two uh, banks of the river. We're also building permanent bridges, bridges that will stay there for a long time, because we don't want this to be temporary. We want this to be a permanent connection, a permanent bridging between the two sides. When the bridges were broken, a lot of communication was broken. The people who live on temporarily occupied territories weren't getting information, they weren't getting the truth. There was a break in that connection. Now, not only are we rebuilding those bridges, but we're also rebuilding their access to getting the truth. 
Some bridges, not something that we really want to see. Here we see the plans for the Russian troops to be building pontoon bridges over a river so that they can supply tanks and weapons to the troops attacking Ukraine. However, their bridges are only pontoon bridges because they're only thinking about temporary bridging. They're thinking about destroying rather than building something new. I think a lot of you recognize what these are. On the right is the S-Mark, the old Soviet-style tourniquet. On the left is a combat application tourniquet, the new modern tourniquet. What's the connection between the two? Back in the 1860s, when S-Mark, Frederick S-Mark, a German, discovered this new tourniquet, it was revolutionary. He created this big piece of material which you could wrap around someone's leg, cut off the blood flow, and then when you had an amputation performed, there would be much less ble bleeding. Currently, it's only used by the Soviet, Russian now, military, and if you wanted to buy one, you can buy one for about $4 on eBay as sort of a uh, curiosity of uh, old uh, Soviet technology. On the other side, we see the CAT, the Combat Application Tourniquet. Been tested over and over again, first patented in 2005. The Combat Application Tourniquet has decreased mortality from ca uh, catastrophic bleeding on the battlefield by 85%. It's rated as 100% effective by the United States uh, Army surgical teams. What's the bridge between these two, the S-Mark and the CAT? I'll tell you. It's this, evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine, which is based on clinical expertise, best research evidence, and patient values and preferences. Clinical expertise, best research evidence tells us that the cat is the best tourniquet in the world. It saves lives. The last portion of it, which is patient values and preferences, I think that we can all say that every soldier would like to, first of all, not die, and secondly, preserve their limb. So all three of those components are in the combat application tourniquet. What bridges the two is knowledge. It's change. It goes from the old to the new. The other thing that bridges the gap between the two of them is training and skills and education. Teaching soldiers how to use the tourniquet, how they can save their lives and their buddy's life. And this sort of not very visible bridging can be sometimes the most important kind of bridge. We all recognize what this is, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. It's the building block of life. It's a double helix, which means there are two strands, two strands that are twisted around each other, and it looks kind of like a spiral staircase. The bridging between those two strands are the nucleotides which hold all of our genetic information. It's the pattern of those nucleotides that make us who we are. It helps us to reproduce. It, cr it makes the proteins that we need to live. Without that bridging, we could not exist. Bridging of DNA helps us to be who we are. Bridges can also be in a ship. We can see that uh, the same kind of bridge, called a mustok, can be in as the, the uh, place where the captain sits and directs where the ship is going. Back in the old days, sailors didn't have these bridges. The captain would control or would direct where the ship was going from the quarter deck. However, when the paddle-wheeled ships came into existence, they blocked the view of the captain. So they built a bridge across the two paddle buildings so that the captain could stand above it and look around 360 degrees and see where they were going bridging the gap from where they were to where they want to be. This new type of bridge can let us see 360 degrees around from all the way right, all the way left, what was behind us and what was ahead of us. DNA, directly photographed for the first time. 
59 years later, after Watson and Crick discovered that DNA existed as a double helix, we'd only imaged it uh, not directly, indirectly. We didn't exactly know what it looked like on the inside. We had a lot of theory, but we didn't have a lot of knowledge. To bridge that gap, we imaged DNA using an electron microscope. Vision is another form of bridging. Vision to see what we can, what we didn't see before, moving from one area of knowledge into another. You may notice that uh, this article was written on November 30th, 2012, approximately one year from the day that the students were beaten up on the Maidan. At that time, the students wanted to go into Europe, and they were being forced to stay in the past. That bridge that was going to be built towards Europe was being destroyed by those who were in power. This is the close-up image of that DNA. How did it get imaged? Very interesting pattern. They took a uh, uh, Petri dish, built in it an entire new structure where there were tiny silicone pillars, poured water that was uh, filled with DNA into this structure, and the silicone pillars the DNA then uh, caught onto the silicone pillars and formed small bridges. So the bridges that were formed by the DNA allowed us to see what we wanted to see. Seeing is very important. I'm a radiologist. Much of my work was vision, seeing, bridging the gap of knowledge by imaging. This is what most people think of when they think of radiologists, sitting in a dark room looking at these images. This was my office. It actually looks like this. You sit in a nice, well-lit room. You have very modern uh, uh, monitors in front of you. You're able to work in a nice, normal environment. It always, wasn't always this way. Back in World War I, Marie Curie discovered that there, were, there was a very big problem with soldiers' deaths. The surgeons weren't able to see what was going on inside the soldiers' bodies closer to the battlefield. The soldiers were dying before they ever got to imaging. What she found was that perhaps using imaging, bringing it closer to the front line, we could save more soldiers' lives. Marie Curie, up to this time, had never actually x-rayed a patient. She never really was involved in any clinical work, but she bridged the gap between theory and practice, and came up with a really brilliant idea. Instead of bringing the soldiers to where the x-ray machine was, let's bring the x-ray machine to where the soldiers are. And she went to the French government, she went to car manufacturers, and they came up with this little vehicle that contained an x-ray machine. It was called a Petite Curie. This vehicle had the x-ray machine in it and drove much closer up to the front line. The actual x-ray machine was powered by the motor, very clever, and also it allowed surgeons who were at the front line to see what was going on inside the body. Up until then, there had been this horrible practice called probing, where they would put their finger into the bullet hole and probe around and try to find where the bullet was to do the surgery and take it out. And yes, it's just as painful and as unsterile as it sounds. Once Madame Curie brought the x-rays closer to the battlefield, the surgeons were able to find those bullets and take them out in a much easier, faster manner. When they did that, they saved more lives. She bridged the gap between life and death, helping patients live longer. Now let's look at some images from the current war. We can see this. It's pretty obvious to everybody, right? There's a bullet inside the person's skull. Do we need to take it out, or can we leave it in there? Here's another x-ray. There's a very tiny little fragment inside this person's skull. Is that something that's important? Seems like it wouldn't be important because it's so small. Well, we look at the other images on that second patient, and actually, there's a lot of damage inside the brain. There's a lot of bleeding, there's a lot of mass effect, there's even extra fragments, which we don't see on the initial imaging. These are problems that need to be taken care of, 
Even though the big bullet could be left behind, the small bullet cannot. This, does anybody know what this is? Has anybody seen this before? It's a digital mammogram. It's a picture of a breast. This is what I did, this was my specialty. There's a cancer on this picture. It's here. I know it's there. You say, well, why is this any different than this? The difference in knowing why this one, the top one is a cancer and the bottom one is not, is this, a medical degree. By the way, this is a medical degree that has been questioned. Uh, it's real, it does exist, so people who want to burn bridges instead of build bridges so that they can take a look at it. This medical degree, the four years of medical school, the four years of, of residency, the, the year of fellowship, the thousands of hours of practice, the thousands of hours that I spent studying, gives us an example of one of the most important bridges of all, and that's education. Education that takes some, us from not knowing where we are to knowing what we want to be, to what we want to know. The future. This is a Starship Enterprise, and this is the bridge. The bridging from past to present, from present to future. The Starship Enterprise not only traveled great distances, but also traveled in time. Einstein Rosen, wormholes, folding time space so that we can travel great distances or travel through time. The theory exists, we've never seen it actually happen, but this is a filmmaker's representation of what it would look like. Traveling through time from past to present, bridging the gap from what was to what is to what can be. This brings me to a story, the story of Maria and this Vishavanka. Maria was born in a small town in western Ukraine. And at age 10, she went to her brother, 19-year-old brother's funeral. Her brother died because he belonged to an organization that wanted to preserve Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian language. The pacification police came to his school, beat him over his head, and after he escaped into the fields where he stayed for several hours in the cold, wet fields, by the time he came home, he had brain edema, and he died. The entire village came out to support the family, to say that this was an injustice, this shouldn't have happened. Very similar to the kinds of things that happened in Ukraine just three years ago. This 10-year-old girl never forgot. At age 17, she was married, and as tradition has it, she embroidered her vishivanka, her blouse, for her wedding day. She had a daughter, and in 1939, World War II broke out. She didn't sit by and let things happen. She joined the underground. She became a courier for the organization and also hid a lot of the soldiers and a lot of the underground agents in her home. One time, she even had an incident where the uh, members of the underground were in the home and a bullet, uh, the gun went off and there was a bullet hole in the wall. The next day, the Soviet police came and they were asking about this uh, supposed gun, gun fire that was in the house the day before. And the little girl, the little daughter, kept pointing at the hole in the wall. And the mother kept shooing her away into the other room to not have her point at the wall. Well, to keep her daughter safe, Maria gave her daughter away to her sister to be raised in a safe home. After World War II was over, Maria had to leave Ukraine. She took her husband, she took her uh, daughter, and she took her Vishavanka. She left, traveled by ship, by train, by car, any way that she could, even walking into Germany. There, she was in displaced persons camps for several years, where the, the Ukrainian community, those that had been displaced, formed schools, choirs. They also had medical uh, services. They really formed a new community for themselves. In time, she was sponsored to come to the United States by a Christian organization to Louisiana, where she and her family were put on a plantation, lived in a hut on stilts in the bayous, and picked cotton to work off their passage. 
After about a year or so, their distant family in Detroit invited them to come up to Detroit. They went north, and there they started looking for jobs. Maria worked in a meatpacking factory. She ground meat, she made sausages, she did all that she could so that she can keep her family going. The, the husband, her husband would go on job interviews with his 11-year-old daughter so she could, uh, she could interpret for him because he didn't speak English. Nobody taught them English, there were no social services, they only helped each other. The community supported each other by giving each other loans and helping each other out. They also kept the ideals, the culture, the history alive. They spoke the language at home, they sent their children to Ukrainian schools, they went to Ukrainian church, they kept preserved what it was that they had left behind and waited, waited to come back to Ukraine. Well, Maria is alive and well, 95 years old. She's my maternal grandmother. And she gave me her Vishavanka to take with me to Ukraine when I moved here. That Vishavanka is like a wormhole. It helps us to preserve our memories. It helps us to remember what was, what is, and what will be. And the threads with which we embroider the patterns of our lives, these are the bridges that we form every day. The bridges that we form amongst ourselves, the bridges that we form all around us. And my advice to you is go where your heart leads you. Do what you think is right, and don't let anybody tell you that you should go a different way. Because in the end, when we look back at the embroidery, at the pattern of our lives, what we'd like to see is those bridges that have embroidered the pattern of our lives and made us who we are. Thank you.